Hello and welcome back, Royal Family. We're creeping up on the end of the August, year of our Lord, 2023. It is 8, 24, 23 is your date. <clears throat> Excuse me. Still a little funky in the throat and nose, but nothing too bad. We're getting on the other side of it. 8, 24, 23 is your date. Your title is the Lord's Prayer. And we are in lesson 127, 1 Thessalonians lesson 127. Let me get situated a little bit. What I'm going to be doing, um, I don't know if it's going to be today or tomorrow, but hopefully by the end of this coming weekend coming up, sometime between Friday afternoon and Sunday night, is I'm going to do a short informative video and I'm actually going to use my new projector and screen that I have for Bible conferences I just purchased. I have like a uh, old school projector, not old, but it's brand new, but it's one of those ones you can plug your laptop in and then I bought the screen so you can do like an office presentation on a big screen and it's all portable so I can take it around with me and do Bible conferences, which I found very exciting, good idea. So I'm going to use that. I got to test it. It all came in the other day and um I'm going to do probably a five to eight minute, five to ten minute video with all the information about the Bible conference. All the information about the Bible conference. So look for that. It's going to be on YouTube, Bright Dion Rumble. I'll put it on Facebook. So you'll see it out there. I'll probably shoot that uh, maybe today. I have to see. But I'm going to put an infomercial out there. And it's going to have all the information. The hotel, the dates, where the venue is for the November Bible Conference, all those kind of things are going to be on there. And then that will go on prbministry.org, bottom of the slide, my two-page website. That video will be on there. Their information is already on that website. If you look around, there's some information about the Bible Conference. I'll be putting that video on there, so you'll be referenced to that video either on YouTube, Rumble, Brighton, or Facebook, or on my webpage, and it'll have all the information for you. So, having said that, that's coming out. We're getting to a place now at the end of August where you guys need to start making your plans. You want to start looking at flights. I'd say in the next, I don't know, 8 to 10 days, you might want to look at the flights that are happening in November. Now, you might wait a little bit later in September and find better flights. But, if you wait until, I would say, maybe... The first or second day of September to make your hotel reservations, that's fine. We have until October 10th for the deal on the hotel, October 10th. So having said that, I'm going to do a video. Also, other announcement. Remember, we have currently a generous offer from an anonymous donor. Generous offer of a plane tickets and hotel fees. Three nights, three days at the hotel, and the plane tickets, everything covered, given to a couple or a small family, meaning no more than two kids, two adults, obviously, who would like to go to the November Bible Conference, but is in a financial pinch. If you're in a financial pinch, and I'll give it to a single person as well, if there's not a couple out there with kids that want to travel, they take priority. I am going to vet the person because this is going to be a gift of probably, you know, thousand dollars or more to make sure you're covered. So if you would like to go to the November Bible Conference and you're in a financial pinch, contact me in the next couple of weeks and let me know. And I will vet what you tell me. Make sure I find out who you are, where you're from. And I'll make sure you get that money for the plane ticket. And also for the hotel be covered. Three nights, three days at the hotel and your plane tickets. Very generous offer for somebody in our congregation. So I'm excited about it. You should be. Think about it. Maybe there's somebody in your circle of family and friends that wants to go. But the first thing they say is I can't afford to. There's an opportunity. There it is. I can only put it out there. You guys do what you want with it. It's out there. Those are our announcements. Look for a small, short, informative video infomercial about the conference coming up in the next three to four days. Also, keep in mind, we have a generous offer. Somebody's willing to pay plane tickets and hotel fees for the conference for the right people. 
put it that way. So having said that, let's do the most important thing we do, folks. Get into the Word. Those are my two announcements for right now. We're actually going to be opening up in Matthew chapter 6 today. I'm going to cover something about the Lord's Supper I taught on one time about four or five years ago. And it needs to be touched on in this series in Matthew chapter 6. So you're welcome to go there. We're getting ready to do the most important thing we do, which is what? Get into the Word. Because in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw His glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And like newborn babes, long for that pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow, I may grow, we all grow in the word of God habitually, filled with the spirit, two power options, active in our life. Let us prepare to take in the word of God. In doing so, believers, name and sight any known sins. Wash yourself clean, opening up the filling power of the spirit, which gives forth that Christ-like nature, an opportunity to come out. New nature. 1 John 1, 8, 9, and 10, believers, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, cleansing us from all unrighteousness. <clears throat> Excuse me, 1 John 1, 10 says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. Take a moment of silent prayer. Name and sight any known sins first. Get your fellowship in order. Secondary, remove any distractions in your periphery, in your mind. And let's get ready to focus on the Word of God first and foremost, naming and citing sins. Secondary, getting rid of distractions. Third, let's pray for everything going on in this world. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. And dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and study your word. And Father, we're lifting up this lost and dying world in prayer. We're lifting up the Bible conference in prayer. And Father, I want to lift up those generous believers that made this offer. You know who they are. They remain anonymous. Father, we have several believers like that that follow this congregation, lift this ministry up. Without them, we may be lost. So Father, we want to lift them up in prayer. They're living in their new nature more than their old nature they're walking in their spiritual priesthood they're walking in their ambassadorship they are soldiers willing to go knee deep in combat spiritual combat and father we want to lift them up give them our prayers and our love and father we're also lifting up the bible conference in november that you keep your hand on that and there's plenty of things going on in this world we need to pray for father We've kept people in prayer recently in the last couple of weeks. And again, we're lifting the same people up again in prayer. We know everyone is struggling with their own issues right now. Medical issues, personal issues, financial issues. And we know the devil's world is attempting to build the tribulation period all around us right now. And Father, in that chaos, in that confusion, in those counterfeits, let us find your strength and your word to stand in, to live in, to go forward and be examples. Be the shining light on the hill for others. Whether it's unbelievers bringing them to the gospel or lost believers bringing them to the truth. Let us move forward in our calling. Father, we're praying for all these things. Through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's jump into it. Matthew chapter 6 is where we're going to pick it up today. We are in a short series on prayer. I've covered this subject a few times in the last probably four years, but it's very important to cover, especially where we were at in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now, contrary to some denominational dogma, the prayer in Matthew chapter 6 is not the Lord's Prayer, really, but a template for prayer. A lot of people don't understand that. They're not taught the right way because of certain denominational dogma, as I always say. Satan's counterfeit of religious systems. So it is a template for prayer, church age believer, Matthew chapter 6. But it's not necessarily the Lord's Prayer. Even though it's marked that way in your Bible, I would be careful how you view this. You have to look at all the principles, the historic context, what was going on, 
Who was Jesus talking to at the moment? Why was the scripture written? What does it apply to? What age does it apply to? Historical context, historical terms, important. The language is important as well, some of the original language, and also the categories, categorical doctrines, scripture aligning with scripture. So, just as man-made religion always does, they have twisted and counterfeited what was originally taught. Big problem. The prayer Jesus used in John chapter 17, we'll not look at that today, maybe next lesson if God leads me there, God the Holy Spirit, but the prayer used in John chapter 17 is best suited for the term, the Lord's Prayer, John 17. I've taught on the doctrine of prayer several times since starting this online ministry because it's so valuable, and God the Holy Spirit brings forth the doctrine of prayer occasionally. Also, it is a doctrine that at least once a year, I would say, maybe more than that, but at least once a year, you should go over and remind ourselves of these things. Doctrine of Prayer. This will probably be only a three-part series, maybe four, where God the Holy Spirit leads us. We're in part two right now. Yet I think the repetition for most of us will be very enlightening, not just new believers, all of us. Some of you are going to say, well, I think you taught this before three or four years ago, or I remember a portion of the Doctrine of Prayer you touched on nine months ago, whatever. I think it's going to be enlightening and there's going to be some things, as is always the case, you go over and go, oh, I didn't realize that. Oh, so wise, spiritual mature believer. What you will see in Matthew chapter 6 is a lesson and a basic template for church age prayer. It's a lesson Jesus is getting into and a template for church age prayer. And the lesson he was talking about was all the religious nonsense the scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees had laid out for the Jewish people. And Jesus is pulling them away from that. Really, that was going on in ch uh, chapter 5 into chapter 6. He was calling out all the religious nonsense, man-made religion. Matthew 6.6. 6. But as for you, my apostles, my disciples, my serious students, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, pray to your Father, who is in secret, and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, this may seem very basic for you, but if you rewind the history tape back about 2,000 years, and you're dealing with a group of Jewish believers and the temple and the rituals the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin had embarked upon for many years, this is pretty radical. This is pretty radical. So for those people that say, well, Jesus didn't change that much before the cross. He didn't really change and turn away from a lot of Judaism. I'd say you don't know your Bible. But as for you, when you pray, he says, from now on, he's telling them, here's what you're going to do. Go into your inner room, at home, by yourself, concentration, close your door, pray to your father who's in secret. Your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Stop going to anybody else and praying and getting involved in religious nonsense. Other than prayer over food and group prayer for healing and certain blessings, your prayer life is extremely intimate between you and God. That's what he's saying. You're pivoting, gentlemen, apostles at this time, Jewish men. You're pivoting away from some of the traditions you even learned through the Sanhedrin. Other than prayer over food, group prayer for healing, certain blessings like when I was ordained, uh, Pastor Bob and, and the deacons that uh, stood by me and watched me pass all the tests I needed to pass for my ordination laid hands on me and prayed on me. There's certain times group prayer is great. Families should pray together at the dinner table. But other than prayer over food and group prayer for healing and certain blessings, husbands and wives praying together, those kind of things. Your prayer life is extremely intimate between you and God. Don't make a scene when you pray. It takes concentration. It takes a lot of intimacy, real prayer. Jesus is stating right from the first part of the prayer lesson that something is new on the horizon. There's no temple. He's not telling them, get involved in any rituals and temples. No priest involved. It's now between you and God. 
Notice how he's cutting out a lot of the middleman here. Very important. You are the believer priest in the church age dispensation. Your soul is the temple for the Trinity in the church age dispensation. This is a pivot towards what was coming after the cross. You are the believer priest in the church age dispensation. Your soul is the temple for the Trinity in the church age dispensation. Jesus then immediately addresses ritualistic repetition. Jesus then immediately, this, this gets a lot of religious people upset. Jesus then immediately addresses ritualistic repetition. Repetition. This is Jesus, not Pastor Rick. He actually states in the original context, do not do, <laughs> do not do, or do not use meaningless repetition. Boy, I could go into some church denominations and spiritual gurus and pulpits that use a lot of meaningless repetition. Matthew 6, 7. And when you are praying, do not use thoughtless repetition, really meaningless repetition, it means as well, stuttering and stammering. It's actually batalogeo, batalogeo, as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. You know your prayer sometimes, if your focus is right, you're filled with the Spirit, and your prayer aligns with the plan of God, a two-minute prayer like that is better than a 20-minute prayer when your fellowship is in question and you're praying for things outside the plan of God and you're trying to impress God or someone else. Nothing wrong with a two-minute prayer, very focused in the new nature, aligning in God's will. Not the many words and rituals. Stuttering and stammering, repet repetitive words. Stuttering and stammering, repetitive words. That's one of the definitions for geo. God is not impressed with a set of words or terms repeated that simply resemble religious rituals. God is not impressed with a set of words or terms repeated that simply resemble religious rituals. As often I tell people, and you'll see it in the study, I'll, I'll highlight it again. My personal studies, I can back some of this up with Scripture, so I believe it's from the Word of God, is that when you're really focused in praying the right way, you need to go to God several times about your request about something and kind of let it go and give it over to God and then maybe circle back down around later on. Don't every day, 10 days in a row, for 20 minutes at a time, repetitively say the same thing over and over again. Because you want something. Give it over to God and trust with faith. Repetition's good, but you have to be careful in this realm. Batalogeo really means useless words. Terms or phrases repeated that make little or no sense. Over and over again. It was sometimes used as a term for a person with a speech impediment, such as stuttering. Not to make fun of them, it was just a term. It was a term for somebody that may stutter or stammer on their words. By the way, never forget, many historians believe Moses had a speech impediment and God used him in a mighty fashion. So don't let a slight disability stop you from going forward in the plan of God. Many historians believe Moses had a speech impediment such as stuttering or stammering on his words and God used him in a mighty fashion. But I'm telling you, that's one of the definitions. Many believers do not even recognize the works program within repetitive prayer. Everything has balance, doesn't it, in life? I tell you that all the time, especially in the plan of God. There's always balance. Many believers, listen to me carefully, do not even recognize the works program within repetitive prayer. Because what you're saying after a period of time is, I don't trust God as it hearing me or listening to me, so I'm going to force it through my flesh because I'll make him favor me. It can become like a works program of speaking the same phrases over and over again, thinking you have some special inner strength to summon God to your wishes. Be careful of it is all I'm telling you. Yes, repetition and prayer matters. I'll show you that. I'm just telling you there's a fine line and there is a balance. <clears throat> Matthew 6, 8. So do not be like them. Why is he saying Gentiles? He's really referencing unbelievers. But Gentiles, 
There's a lot of rituals and worships going on back then of false gods. <clears throat> and they would stand and do repetition. So do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. One of the best reasons, <clears throat> one of the best reasons you need to be in Bible study habitually is because what? The Father, God the Father, knows what you need before you ask him. So why should I be in Bible study? Because you're going to get your answers. God gives us answers before our questions. God gives us solutions before the problem <clears throat> makes us stumble. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jesus is moving the apostles away from the rituals of religion. Jesus is moving the apostles away from the rituals of religion. Remember, Jesus' ministry, his earthly ministry, those last three years, three and a half years, some argue, before that cross, that three and a half, three years before the cross was a pivotal transition point. And that's what a lot of this is. Jesus is moving the apostles away from rituals of religion. God knows what we need from eternity past. He knows the problem and the solution. But you have to be available. Any repetition in prayer is designed to show your faith and communication with God is starting to grow. That's really what repetition shows. It's not that God doesn't know. A lot of people ask that. It shows that your faith, which I'm telling you, there is a balance. Your faith is great in repetitive prayer, but it loses its greatness in repetitive prayer because you're saying you lack faith when you don't finally hand it over to God and trust him. And think you need to keep screaming at the same thing for three months in a row. God, give me this. God, give me that. God, I need this. God, I need that. Be careful. That, so you're showing faith and spiritual growth in the repetition, but be careful how far you go. It is not a call to continually plead with God because you think he is ignoring you. Now you're lacking faith. It is not a call to continually plead with God because you think he is ignoring you. So let us read through this. We're going to read right through here, the Lord's Prayer, as it's written in your Bible. And then I'm going to quickly tear it apart and highlight some important factors. So, you know, get your pens and paper ready because I know there's some people in denominations and your family and friends that are going to argue these points. I'm giving you all the information I can give you. Matthew 6, 7. Let me grab a drink. <clears throat> Matthew 6, 7. Pray then, after he gave those other instructions in the last couple of scriptures, look at verse 7. Pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Matthew 6, 10. Excuse me, Matthew 6, uh, is that 8 or 10? I think I might have the wrong scripture. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors, Matthew 6, 13, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, that's the Lord's Prayer as we've known it growing up, especially with certain denominational things, and most Christians would say, yes, that's the Lord's Prayer. But then Jesus makes a strong point in closing. Verse 14, for if you forgive other people for their offenses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you, Matthew 6, 15. But if you do not forgive other people, then your Father will not forgive your offenses. Which I mentioned last lesson is a reason for many Christian prayers to fall short of the divine throne room of heaven. They haven't really forgiven people. Therefore, God will oftentimes withhold forgiveness from you because of your bitterness. Be careful of it. It's a warning. Now, let's look at it. Matthew 6, 9. I think I put a couple wrong numbers there on the scriptures in my notes. <clears throat> Matthew 6, 9. Pray in this way, he says. Pray in this manner, he means. This is a present active imperative. Many of you understand the Greek now. You've been with me for a little while. Maybe you've been under somebody else that understands these things. Present active imperative. Keep on praying along this pattern. Pray in this way, in this pattern, but keep on doing this. Doesn't mean to use these exact words. 
He's talking about a template, a pattern. Does not mean to use these exact words. It means to use this pattern habitually. This is a model to follow without imitating the words exact, exactly each time. This is a model to follow without imitating the words exactly each time. That's what Jesus is saying. If you really tear this apart, who he's talking to, the lesson he's giving, and some of the original context, what he's saying is, follow this manner, follow this template. This is laid out for you. He doesn't say repeat these exact words. That's not what he's saying. This is a model to follow without imitating the exact words each and every time. But as is always the case, man takes something that God gives us and with Satan's help, twists and distorts it. Then you have a counterfeit. Our father, it says, all prayer is addressed to who? The father, God, the father, Matthew 6, 9. In the name of the Son, John 14, 13, 14 highlights this. In the power of what? God, the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 6, 18. The power source, our power source right now in the temporal is God, the Holy Spirit's ministry. But we have to go to the Father, God, the Father. You'll notice when I open up in prayer, I always say, Heavenly Father. I show my respect, Divine Father, Heavenly Father. I go to the Father and I end it in the name of Jesus Christ. And I recognize the power of the Holy Spirit is at work now. So Matthew 6, 9, the Father first, in the name of the Son, John 14, 13. Now, people ask, should I do it at the beginning or the end? Make sure you at least do it at the end. But throughout the prayer you have, you can always say, Dear Father, dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you. And you speak and you are grateful and you have your a uh, uh, repetitive prayer as long as it's done the right way and then end it again in the name of Jesus Christ in the works and name of Jesus Christ in the merits of Jesus Christ and you know the power of the Holy Spirit Ephesians 6 18 is active immediately we address God the Father first in prayer very important right thing done in the right way we note in verse 9 it's the present active imperative Imperative is always very important. It's a command in the Greek, meaning keep on. Keep on praying along this pattern. Jesus is saying, this is how it's done now. It should be doing, but done this way. Going forward, present tense, always. Imperative is a command. It's very strong. Keep on praying along this pattern. This is a command, not from Pastor Rick, from the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And by a pattern, I mean in the same manner. Not a chant of the same prayer and same words over and over again. Now you're getting into chanting. There's a lot of people that like to finger the beads and chant different things over and over again. Make sure you do the right thing in the right way. This is a command from the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. By a pattern, I mean in the same manner. Not a chant of the same prayer over and over again. Now the pattern of prayer in Matthew 6-7 Actually, through verse 13, hopefully I got those scriptures right. Sometimes I'm putting the notes together, and I'll, I'll put one number wrong in my scriptures, and I'll get the next couple one. Mess me all up. But the pattern of prayer in Matthew 6, 7 through 13 covers aspects of proper protocol in prayer. Right thing done in the right way. Proper protocol in prayer. This recognition of the plan of God the Father for our life in the prayer. Praying for daily strength or supplies in a grateful manner. That's another aspect of your prayer. God always supplies our logistical needs. But we are to pray for things. We are to pray for things and pray in a grateful manner. Seeking forgiveness of our own sins and failure is very important. In fact, you need to start the prayer off with that. While what? Releasing bitterness and unforgiving spirit toward others. Now listen, I can tell you from my own life, experience and even speaking with other Christians and the man who ordained me, Pastor Bob, sometimes in prayer, when you're really struggling with somebody who's attacked you, somebody who's made an enemy in your life, become an enemy, you can take that prayer and say, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, forgive me of my bitterness toward this person. I'm struggling with the unforgiveness. They've hurt me. And you can talk to God as your father like that if you do the protocol the right way and say, give me the strength to be able to separate from them a long distance and let me go forward in your plan and figure out, Father, give me the strength 
how to love them from a distance first, which is always the best thing when you have an enemy. Learn to love them from a distance at first. Over time, you'll find out that if the enemy is willing, you can come together down the road and have at least a normal conversation. But it's okay to pray in that vein, asking for that strength, if you do it the right way. So seeking forgiveness of our own sins and failures have to be in your prayer, but you have to release bitterness and unforgiving spirit toward others. Otherwise, your prayer life is dead in the water, as they say. There was an important theme going on in chapter 5 into chapter 6 of Matthew. So Matthew chapter 5 and 6 flow right together. There's great lessons in there, and this all connects. So you can't cherry pick a few things and forget what he was teaching about, the legalism of the scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees' religion. So there was an important theme, historical context, going in chapter 5 into chapter 6 of Matthew that points to religion and legalism. Can't ignore that aspect. Jesus highlights pseudo-righteousness in these chapters and religion of the day concerning public prayer. If you were to read chapter 5, especially the end of chapter 5, into the beginning of chapter 6 that we're in right now with the Lord's Prayer, you would see what he's talking about with pseudo-righteousness and the religion of the day concerning public prayer. He rebukes the Pharisees to illustrate how the religious standards of the day have failed. This has been a theme of the Lord's lesson from the start of the sermon in chapter 5 because he's trying to pivot them away from religion. So this has been a theme. You can't ignore chapter 5 is what I'm telling you when, you when you study what I'm teaching you today. This has been a theme of the Lord's lesson from the start of the sermon in chapter 5, pulling them away and drawing them away from man-made religion, self-righteousness, the religion of the day, coming from the scribes, Sadducees, and Pharisees. You grab a drink. <clears throat> You know that uh, most of that problem in my chest broke a couple of days back. But then all of a sudden, every once in a while, you go to speak and you get some kind of nasty in your throat. You know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> but I can go <sighs> now and not have a coughing fit, which is good. And uh, I really didn't get involved in medicine. I try to promote all the God-given things, God-given immunity, vitamin C, zinc, vitamin D, rest, all those things, folks. So that's what took care of it. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ presents the model prayer for the disciples, and the reason he gives this is to demonstrate the failure of human good added into the Word of God. Let me say that again. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ present, presents the model prayer for the disciples, and the reason he gives this is to demonstrate the failure of human good added into the Word of God. He's actually highlighting Satan's trump card, religion. This model of prayer must be understood concerning its context. This model of prayer must be understood concerning its context. So, that's why I highlight chapter 5 into chapter 6 and what the lesson is. Again, what's the historical context of going on in that moment of time? Who's being spoken to? What's the lesson focused on? The first lesson of the model prayer is brief but direct inaccuracy. It is a model prayer for the crash course prior to the church age, which, remember, the cross of Jesus Christ split history. The first lesson of the model prayer is brief but direct in accuracy. It is a model prayer for the crash course prior to the church age. Dispensational knowledge, and I'm smiling when I'm saying this because somebody went out of their way on Facebook to mention something recently, and I put a comment up, and then a a great wise man came on there to, to make comments against me. Um, but it was my personal Facebook page. It's okay. The first lesson of the model prayer is brief but direct in accuracy. It is a model prayer for the crash course prior to the church age. Listen to me carefully. Dispensational knowledge is beginning to open up. He's pivoting them. Remember that the Sermon on the Mount was a way of life. For the disciples during the next three years. It was a foundational period. It was a transitional period. And like I said, the reason I'm smiling is because there was a question somebody asked me to answer because of the people talking about modern day prophets. 
And I explained, I don't put God in a box, but there's probably no modern day prophets. There's people that can discern. And I tried to explain something about dispensations. And the person immediately came back and says, you don't know what you're talking about. I've studied, I've studied hermeneutics for years and I have a degree in engineering and I do this and I've studied my Bible since 73. And he went into all these things that he did and said who he was. Big, big, long to do. And then he brought up all these Old Testament prophecies. And then he brought up one New Testament thing, and I think it was Acts 15 or Acts 5. I forget which one it was off the top of my head. And I said, you're pointing something out that's being quoted from the prophet Amos in relation to the tribulation period after the tribulation period, the millennial reign. So what you're quoting is really a dispensational issue you're a little confused on. And all they could do was bring, well, this prophet said this in the Old Testament and prophecy is still available today and blah, blah, blah. But I'm thinking, you're confused. On, and I just left it alone. He went on and on, like two or three comments like that long. I never responded because I was like, okay. I said, you're the genius of the day. You know, run with what you want, but you never really address the dispensational issue. And you're, ta you're, you're, you're commenting on all these things related to prophecy and it's all Old Testament. You bring up one scripture in Acts where it's actually quoted from Amos, Dispensation of Israel, and it's a prophecy related to after the tribulation millennial reign. Yes, there's going to be an establishment of the Jews again in the millennial reign. Yes, there's going to be those that speak and do all kinds of wonderful things that we saw in the other dispensation of Israel. People lose their mind dispensational knowledge is beginning to open up even for the apostles here it's becoming clearer and most scholars even back in the day thousands of years ago understood there was a change and switch they didn't understand all the dispensational issues but they understood there was times and ages and epochs ages and seasons where things change this was a foundational period this is a legitimate petition for the disciples during the three years of our Lord's ministry. During the three years of our Lord's ministry, legitimate petition. Part of the prayer, much like a large portion of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's lesson so far, was designed to expose the self-righteousness and hypocrisy of the Pharisees who would not admit to personal sin nor extend grace beyond their circle of family and friends. That was a lot of the issues, chapter 5 into chapter 6 in Matthew. Part of the prayer, much like a larger portion of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's lesson so far, was designed to expose the self-righteousness and the hypocrisy of the Pharisees who would not admit to personal sins, nor extend grace beyond their circle of family and friends they didn't understand grace religion never really does understand grace and people that are wrapped up in religion and nonsense don't understand dispensational knowledge usually don't understand god's grace plan either jesus had already amplified the mosaic law again you'd have to go back we're not going to do that beginning in chapter five but jesus had already amplified the mosaic law by extending it to thought patterns and motivation. When a man sins in his heart, he sins, he's lusting, he does this, he does that, there's murder in your mind. So, Jesus had already amplified the Mosaic Law by extending it to thought patterns and motivation. This cries out for grace. None of us can do it. We need God's grace. The sermon is the full portion of grace being introduced as more than a mere gesture but a lifestyle and trademark of spirituality. Operating in God's grace in the new nature. So the sermon is the full portion of the grace being introduced as more than a mere gesture, but a lifestyle and trademark of spirituality. This prayer has an attitude or pattern within it that is important. Not repetitive instructions to pray over and over again the same set of words chanting chanting so a lot of people do they don't pray they chant like savages around a, a campfire chanting to the rain god 
This prayer has an attitude or pattern within it that is important, not repetitive instructions to pray over and over again. <clears throat> Excuse me. With the introduction of what God's grace resembles, the most subtle forms of legalism are now going to be exposed. Jesus was the king of this. He is King Jesus. But his transition, the foundational peace and the transition and the way he was pulling his disciples away from legalism and religion and he was exposing them to grace what he was doing was showing real subtle forms of legalism they hated it they would lose their mind and become more legalistic toward him it was crazy with the introduction of what god's grace resembles the most subtle forms of legalism they're now being exposed they couldn't get away from him exposing them their legalism this legalism is opposed to grace. It always is. Self-righteous arrogance, pride, pounding your chest, religious rituals, religious nonsense, always opposed to grace. And this will be emphasized in this first prayer as much as it has been in the first section of the sermon. Again, what am I saying? Historically, when you get into Matthew chapter 6 and we say Lord's Prayer, you better understand everything that's being taught. The legalism is opposed to grace, and this will be emphasized in this first prayer as much as it had been in the first section of the Sermon on the Mount. Christ needed to expose human good, religious nonsense, and legalism. Christ needed to expose human good, religious nonsense, and legalism because that had been the standard for spiritual maturity. You have to do this in the temple. You have to treat the Pharisees this way. You better do this. There's shame and guilt in that. All this religious nonsense. Christ needed to expose it all. Because that had been the standard for spiritual maturity. It was never part of God's plan. It's just what mankind does over time. They take something that God gives us that's pure and right and filled with grace and righteousness. And they twist it and counterfeit it. And they do it usually with satanic elements breathing in their ear, telling them, do this and do that. God will love you for it. And it becomes a works program. I had, <clears throat> excuse me, I had mentioned <clears throat> in many previous lessons, the law commands everything in the Bible is fulfilled in what? In the personal work of Jesus Christ. So I had mentioned in previous lessons, many times, the law is fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, there becomes a focus on grace. I also taught you that there is a shift or change from one dispensation into another. There is transitions. We've covered these. If the Lord didn't wake up these future teachers, which is what he's doing, they would fall into great arrogance due to the power he would, he was about to bestow on them leading up to the completed canon of Scripture. Let's face it, the apostles and certain men and women, whether they were giving a gift of prophecy or tongues or healing, whatever they were given, and it wasn't as many as you think, but there were many, but not as many as you think. He was bestowing on them, you live in something like that. Let's say you can walk up to somebody and press your hand on their head and you heal them from blindness. Pretty powerful. After a couple of days of that, you feel like a little God yourself. So if the Lord didn't wake up these future teachers, they would fall into great arrogance due to the power he would bestow on them, leading up to the completed canon of Scripture, which is all we need. Listen, if we need, think about this for a minute, because this prophecy thing makes me crazy. A lot of people are on that tip, because all these platforms and video, YouTube stuff, they're filled with a lot of nonsense and prophets, a lot of, a lot of false teaching. If we needed prophecy after the completed canon of Scripture, then it says the, the person and work of Jesus Christ and the completed canon of Scripture and the apostleship of the twelve, and I mean with Paul, not Judas, was useless. Because we still need a prophet, a human prophet today. And if we have that prophet, we have to go search him out, and then we have to figure out if he's right or wrong and how we're going to align it all. And God, then, is the author of confusion. 
We're given the completed canon of Scripture, which encompasses the person and work of Jesus Christ. But you still want to seek out human prophets and try to vet them and figure out if they're teaching you something good or bad, or you got to wait and see if they taught you something accurate. A lot of confusion, a lot of nonsense. Who's the author of that? If the Lord didn't wake up these future teachers, they would fall to great arrogance due to the power he would bestow on them leading up to the completed canon of scripture and they'd be oh so great prophets and healers there is greater depth in this template template of church age prayer protocol than to focus on rituals and of repeating and chanting words there is greater depth in this template of church age prayer protocol than to focus on rituals of repeating of words it's incredible how mankind has to put their hand in everything has to put their hand in everything. If he doesn't expose legalism, the disciples will abuse the powers that are given to them by catering to their own approbation lust and seeking to impress people with their powers, which you have a lot of that today too. The title, The Lord's Prayer then, is best suited for John chapter 17. Do your homework. Here's some homework for you. Read all of Matthew chapter 5, all of Matthew chapter 6. Take in what I'm teaching you today, and then read John chapter 17. I'll try to touch on it next lesson. Matthew chapter 6 is a brief but enlightening prayer for a group of new converts, these guys are still new, who would be learning and applying grace principles as a foundation and bridge transition into the church age. You know the apostles, obviously the work of Jesus Christ, personal work of Jesus Christ, but the apostles are like a bridge we walk over into the church age. So it's pretty important what they wrote because they wrote what Jesus told them to write. But you still need to go find a prophet in the year of our Lord, 2023. The title, The Lord's Prayer, is best suited for John 17, chapter 17. Matthew chapter 6 is a brief but enlightening prayer for a group of new converts who would be learning and applying grace principles as a foundation and bridge into the church age. Their first mission and focus, what was it? Historically, their first mission and focus was going to be to do what? You should say, find the lost sheep of the house of Israel, the Jews. The apostles at first, before Paul, before the cross, their first mission and focus was going to be what? On the lost house, the sheep of the lost house of Israel, the Jews. Those already indoctrinated into legalism through the scribes and Pharisees were who Jesus was teaching against. He's like, we need to pull the Jews out of this, or at least attempt to. And in his mind, he knew, obviously, they were going to reject him. But that was his first call. Let me pull out the people that God ordained, my father ordained, I ordained, being God, through circumcision and Abraham, and pull them out of this religious system, and then open everything up for everyone. Those already indoctrinated into legalism through the scribes and Pharisees were who Jesus was teaching against. The apostles are about to be called to seek out lost sheep of Israel Matthew chapter 10, few chapters ahead. Matthew chapter 10. Seek out the lost sheep of Israel. Matthew chapter 10. So it's imperative that the disciples be warned about legalism before they begin the ministry to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. What was Paul's calling? Why was Paul's calling so strong on Gentiles? Because the, 11, the other 11 were called during the ministry of Jesus Christ to call out the Jews and establish that situation. Then they all, as they before they died, they all realized, okay, we got to go for the Gentiles. But Paul had to call Gentiles. The first 11 lost sheep of Israel. And consequently, consequently, this model prayer is designed to help them avoid all the pitfalls of legalism. As this prayer begins, it recognizes God the Father... Then it goes directly into basic prayer principles we should pay attention to. What's the first principle of prayer? You should say fellowship. 
First principle of prayer is fellowship. Yes, you go to God the Father, but then what do you do? You must have fellowship with God. You must be in fellowship, filled by God the Holy Spirit. The word hallowed gives us this concept of you to hallowed. Separate yourself. Set yourself apart. Be sanctified. What does that mean? Wash clean. What's part of sanctification? The definition. To wash. They would even have ceremonial washing going into the temple. Temple was the close place next to God. Ceremonial washing. Set apart by his name. Fellowship in order. This means to be in fellowship. Name and sight any known sins. Before prayer or any form of worship, Bible study or divine works. What do you do? Go back to the Last Supper. What did Jesus do? You guys are going to break bread with me. You want to come have this intimate fellowship with me? Wait a minute. Let me wash those feet. Oh, no, no. Give me a bath all over if that's what I need to be close to you, Lord. No, Peter. No believer. You had salvation, one and done, eternal security. Let me just wash those feet. Because the cosmic system and your old sin nature are so close friends. They like to get dirty together. Set apart. Sanctified, wash clean, fellowship, name and sight, any known sins before prayer, any form of worship, Bible study, or divine works. It is in the passive voice, and this means that his name receives this through the believer who's praying. It is in the Greek passive voice, and this means that his name receives this through the believer who is praying, being in fellowship. It is an imperative mood. Command, important. Imperative mood, it is commanding God that his name be set apart. See how it works? You need to tear it apart. So, the aorist tense plus the imperative mood plus the passive voice addressed to God. Jot them down. The aorist tense plus the imperative mood plus the passive voice addressed to God. Receive a set apart name actually adds up to a very strong statement when you look at it. It is the principle of being in fellowship. Simplest way, rubber meets the road. There it is. It is the principle of being in fellowship. If you pray out of fellowship, you cannot be effective. I don't put God in a box. Maybe he'll answer the prayer. I don't know. But I would just say, do the right thing in the right way. Follow the protocol of prayer. It is the principle of being in fellowship. If you pray out of fellowship, you cannot be effective. Being out of fellowship in prayer, Bible study, worship, or deeds, new nature, is meaningless. That's where you get the term wood, hay, and stubble. Beam and seat judgment of Christ, bonfire. There's going to be a couple little bonfires at both of the judgment seats. Obviously, the great white throne judgment at the end will be all the righteousness and deeds that unbelievers did that they want to bring in front of the divine courtroom and say, well, I can enter heaven on this. Keep that in mind. Wood, hay, and stubble. Anything outside of the union with Christ will burn up. Anything outside of our union with Christ will burn up. It's useless, is what I'm telling you. It does nothing for us. Meaningless. <clears throat> Matthew 6.10 Your kingdom come, thy kingdom come You know, you King James people Be careful with that version Yes, I know, some of it's really good Some of it's a little off Not crazy, but a little off Everybody asks me this I can't harp on this enough One of the best Bibles New American Standard Very close to what we speak today And it still touches into the original language Pretty well Ryrie Study Bible, Charles Ryrie, Dr. Charles Ryrie, Ryrie Study Bible, New American Standard. Spend the $60 or whatever it is. Best Bible you'll ever own. Matthew 6.10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We all know that one, right? Amen. Especially people that are raised in a certain denomination. Jesus Christ on earth. The capacity of kingdom was there with the king. King Jesus was with them. This was a look actually into the future. What do you talk about future look? What do we talk about prophecy? What do we talk about end times? What is the theological term? Eschatology. Study of the end events, coming events. What's down the road prophetically? Eschatology. 
your kingdom is a reference to the rule of Jesus Christ on earth. Your kingdom is a reference to the rule of Jesus Christ on earth. Your kingdom come. The Greek goes in the opposite direction. Actually, it's like, come your kingdom. In the original manuscripts, how it's written in the Greek. Come your kingdom is the literal Greek translation. Come your kingdom. So the word come, it indicates the power of the faith rest technique in prayer. It is showing faith rest. We know your kingdom's coming. The word come indicates the power of the faith rest technique in prayer, indicating the principle of believing God will work in your life because you have remained positive in his plan and your faith is strong enough to look ahead and say, I have a calm assurance his kingdom will come. Everything he says in the Bible, not some human prophet after the completed canon of scripture, everything in the completed canon of scripture in the work of Jesus Christ will come to pass. Matthew 21, 22 tells us what? In all things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive faith. Matthew 21, 22. Believing you will receive. All things in prayer, ask. Believing you will receive. Have some strength pointing to the strength of your faith. The kingdom cannot come today when we look at the literal kingdom of Jesus Christ. I'm going to explain some things to you. There's layers there's layers here. The kingdom cannot come. God himself cannot bring the kingdom today. Because what? What has to happen? Rapture, seven-year tribulation. It was possible when the disciples were on the mount because the king was on the earth. King Jesus was physically with the apostles. But the king is in the heavenly today, seated where? At the right hand of God the Father, mission complete. The kingdom in a temporal sense is within the believer's soul that's another layer, especially the church as a body represent a kingdom type on earth. But the literal kingdom of King Jesus is coming. The literal kingdom of King Jesus is coming. But I would tell you the kingdom that you're talking about literal cannot come today. Because God can't go back on his word. He can't lie. There's a couple things God can't do. So if his word teaches there's going to be a rapture, there's going to be a tribulation, then there's going to be a battle of Armageddon. Christ will come down and be the warrior king, highest body count, then establish the thousand-year reign kingdom on earth. The kingdom in a temporal sense is within the believer's soul, yes. Especially the church as a whole, body, church body, represents a form of typology, kingdom on earth. People should look at the body of Christ, our lives, and see a reflection, a little reflection there, of the kingdom of Christ on earth in us. When the king is in heaven, the kingdom can't come, literally. The king is going to stay there until the rapture of the church, when the what? Church body goes up to meet the king, but the king will not meet the church in the air, and he won't be on earth yet. Until the rapture happens. So when the king is in heaven, the kingdom cannot come. The king is going to stay there until the rapture when the church will go up to meet the king. And the king will meet the church in the air and he still won't be on earth is what I meant to say. I'm going to check my notes. He still won't be on earth. Not in the rapture. That's why they need a UFO cover or some kind of mystical cover for the rapture. We're being set up. Not yet. Second advent is when his feet, humanity of Christ, touched the ground and split the Mount of Olives. Battle of Armageddon. Second advent, when his feet, humanity of Christ, touched the ground. Warrior king comes to lay everything waste. He is then going to cleanse his bride and the king will come back during the seven-year tribulation period. He's going to cleanse his bride, wedding party, all kinds of things are going to happen. Be a seat. Judgment of Christ first and foremost after the rapture. Then the king will come back to earth with his bride. And I believe those that come back are the ones who are going to be positive winner believers. There's no equality in heaven. And they rule. And they come back for the battle as leaders, like military leaders. He's then going to cleanse his bride. And then the king will come back to the earth and then begin the millennial reign. 
The physical kingdom we're talking about is the thousand year reign of King Jesus on earth. That's a physical kingdom. We reflect Christ. We're ambassadors. But in the day the disciples could pray, come thy kingdom, come your kingdom, because the king was there with them. And this to be part of their message to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The kingdom's among us. Come on, brothers and sisters. Come on. Pull away from that religion. The Messiah is here. The Savior is here. The kingdom and king is walking among us. The king is here. Come thy kingdom. In the full physical sense pertains to what? Future prophecy. Millennial. But they could have said that back in the day when Christ was walking with them. And probably they did. Many went out in pairs of two. And many went out and spoke to the lost sheep of Israel, saying the kingdom's here, the king is here, just as John the Baptist did. How will you know when the kingdom occurs, the future kingdom? You have to look for the signs and symbols. You have to know your Bible. We have to glorify God in the angelic conflict as reflections of the kingdom of Christ before he returns. We're given that privilege. Yet the true physical kingdom is after seven years of tribulation. So if you want to say, I have the kingdom of Christ, I'm a part of the kingdom of Christ, absolutely you are. There's a piece of the kingdom in you, the Trinity's in you. But the physical kingdom of Christ on earth is coming after rapture, seven years of tribulation. There's a third petition. I'm sorry if this message goes long. This is very important to understand. There's a third petition which amplifies the second. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will, your will, is the will of God. The will of God. God's will at this historic point allows Satan his run. Again, not taught from a lot of denominational dogma. So God's will at this historic point allows Satan his run on earth in the form of authority. Can't argue with that. So when somebody says, well, God brings chaos, who's in... Who's the prince in power of the air right now? Who's allowed his run right now? Satan and his army. He's allowed a title of prince in power of the atmosphere, Ephesians 2.2. 2. Because he knocked mankind, the original man and woman, off the seat of authority in the garden. Yeah, he had a victory in the garden. You know, he, there's a difference between having a victory in battle, a scrimmage, and winning the whole war. Jesus Christ won the whole war on the cross. Satan has little victories along the way, obviously. But he knocked mankind off the seat of authority in the garden. So God's will at this historic point is that we reflect the kingdom as soldiers, ambassadors, believer, priests. We reflect the kingdom in a lost and dying world that, yes, Satan has a lot of power in. I'd be a liar to tell you different. Do you think today, by any stretch of the imagination, that the will of God is being accomplished on earth as it is in heaven? That you have a lot of nonsense and religious scubala that wants to make the earth perfect in the flesh. So we make heaven on earth and then we'll fulfill the will of God. That's not how it's supposed to happen. Not in my Bible. Maybe your prophet told you that. Do you think today by any stretch of the imagination that the will of God is being accomplished on earth as it is in heaven? The devil's the ruler of the world and will rule it until the last phase of the seven years of tribulation. Right up into that battle of Armageddon, he's going to have levels of success. The devil is the god of this world, small g. He's the prince and power of the air. He will rule this world until the second advent. Simplest math I can give you. He will rule this world to the second advent. He'll have some strong authority in this world to the second advent. Now, you have your authority in the plan of God as a believer. You go forward as a warrior. But don't think he's not all around you with his army. When the devil rules the world, the will of God cannot be done on earth as it is in heaven. The earth doesn't resemble heaven right now. God's plan is forging forward, and part of that plan allowed Satan and his army a period to prove their case against him. It's called the angelic conflict. Why you were created. Some events have not yet been fulfilled, obviously. It will be a legitimate prayer for believers at the end of the tribulation, I can tell you that. 
It'll be a legitimate prayer at the end of the tribulation. Matthew 6. Prayer recognizes the plan of God, the Father. The language within it was suited for that historic point when you understand chapters 5 and 6. That prayer today, repeated word for word, really would mean, honestly, you're disoriented to the plan of God. Again, dispensational knowledge so very important. The pattern and protocol of the prayers for the church age believers, yet it's the wording itself that I'm warning you about, which was suited for a period of Christ on earth doctrine of the hypostatic union, transition period, up into the cross splitting history, opening up the church age. The pattern and protocol of the prayers for the church age believer. Pattern and protocol, not the wording. Yet it's the wording itself which was suited for a period of Christ on earth, doctrine of the hypostatic union. Like I said, I know I'll get some religious people scoffing at me. Oh well. More specifically, for the apostles preparing to call out the lost sheep of Israel. So the outline itself is suitable. I guess you can look at it that way. The template, the outline itself is suitable. It is the wording that does not fit the time that we live in, church age dispensation. Also notice, it's not completed or given over to the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why is that? Because Jesus was with them physically. His ministry on earth was not yet complete. That's why it doesn't end in my name, Jesus. He was with them physically. His ministry on earth was not complete. There's an outline of the recognition of the Father, forgiveness of sin, and a grateful heart in the prayer, all forming a basis for prayer. Excellent. Yet the exact language does not suit the church age believer. Just saying. In the name of the work of Jesus Christ is absent from the prayer. Big problem. Christ was with them. The cross had not yet come have to understand when something was written historical context what was being said what was going on in that moment of time was this something addressed to a certain group there's an outline of the recognition of the father forgiveness of sin a grateful heart in the prayer all forming a basis for prayer wonderful template yet the exact language i'm telling you does not suit the church age believer in the name of the work of jesus christ is absent from the prayer that's a big problem christ was with them the cross had not yet come. Please understand the age you live in. Again, when I see something like that comment and then the, the self-righteousness of this person coming forward, telling me all their education and trying to quote things from the Old Testament, I'm thinking, you don't get it. I'm not arguing the point. The person asked the question, is, is there, are there prophets today in the year of our Lord 2023? I said, I don't think so. What I know, I don't put God in a box. We have a completed canon of scripture, and then this person rallies on all kind rallies on all kinds of things, and then you realize they don't understand what dispensation they're living in. I don't know what to tell you, other than study your Bible accurately. I thank you for your time. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, bless this message. Take it out to a lost and dying world through your Son's precious name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.